Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. So uh, it's monthly Q&A video time here again on the channel. Uh, I put up a community post a couple of days ago collecting your questions and we've got quite a few to get through. So um, I'm gonna hit record and kind of just stand here for a while <laughs> answering questions and, and see how many we can get through. So thank you to everyone who did ask a question. If you wanna ask one in a future Q&A video next month, uh, definitely keep an eye out on my community posts uh, page or community page here on YouTube. That's uh, where I always request the Q&A video questions. So if you do want to uh, ask one in a future video, that is the place to go. If you did ask a question and I don't get to it in this video, I apologize, um, but hopefully you can get one in the next month. So uh, let's get to the first question. Okay, so first question here is from Sten Hemming. Could you do evaluation of Berkshire Hathaway? Uh, yeah, I've done a couple of valuation kind of exercises on Berkshire Hathaway in the past. Um, traditionally with Berkshire, a book value multiple is actually a reasonable proxy for intrinsic value. Uh, we know that Berkshire themselves are authorized to buy back shares up to, uh, at a valuation of up to 1.3 times book value. So I think that's probably a reasonable sort of proxy or at least a floor uh, for intrinsic value for Berkshire. But there's people out there who understand Berkshire Hathaway a lot better than me. I've, I think I have a reasonable understanding of Berkshire and can uh, you know come, come to an approximate valuation on it um, but there's uh, a guy called Chris Bloomstrand who runs a fund called Semper Augustus and Berkshire is his biggest position has been for about 20 years I think at this point and he writes really really extensive letters uh, on a whole range of topics Berkshire Hathaway included and uh, every single year actually does an intrinsic value update for Berkshire so I'll try to leave those uh, letters from uh, Chris Bloomstrand link down in the description below if you want to check that out um, but I'm a big fan of cloning, you know, really intelligent investors and Chris Bloomstrand is the number one man to clone uh, when it comes to Berkshire in my book. So I'll leave that link down in the description, like I say, if you want to go check that out. And uh, I think that's probably the best place to go to figure out intrinsic value for Berkshire. So thanks for your question. Uh, next one is from Mosif Khan. Are you invested in IEX? Uh, so IEX is Indian Energy Exchange for anyone that doesn't know. Uh, it's a position, I, I believe, of Guy Spear and Monish Prabhais. They may have sold it recently, I'm not sure, but they've certainly owned it uh, for the past couple of years at least. And uh, it's run up a lot. I did a bit of digging on IEX uh, maybe two or three weeks ago for a punch card investing live stream where we were, we were talking about some international uh, stocks uh, and I kind of came to the conclusion that I think it's a really good business but I've kind of just missed the boat on it the price has gone up uh, a lot over the past uh, couple of years I'll put that up on the screen here if you're interested but um, no I'm not invested in IEX it's kind of one for the watch list but um, I don't have plans to purchase into it uh, anytime soon Okay, next question here is from uh, Ballsy. <laughs> when are you going to start growing a mo? Uh, well, I mean, I'm working on it. That, <laughs> that hurts my soul. But uh, we've got the rest of November to go yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can put together. Um, and, and big thank you to everyone who has been contributing to the Movember cause uh, so far this month. If you want to do that, uh, link is down in the description below for that as well. Uh, the Movember Foundation is a great cause, and we've got uh, a live stream uh, around Movember coming up again this weekend as well. So um, be sure to check that out also. But uh, Thank you, or maybe uh, no thank you for your question there, Ballsy. <laughs> Next one is from An Andy Ortega. Uh, Charlie Munger can look at a stock and determine whether it's a good investment in five minutes. What do you look at in five minutes to determine if an investment can be good? Um, yeah, I would say I have almost the reverse approach to that. It's sort of a Monash Pabrai model, I suppose. Not necessarily trying to say, I think this is a really good investment as soon as possible. I'm trying really to say, uh, you know, this is clearly not a good investment and something I can discard. I'm trying to kind of get rid of ideas as quickly as possible. And if it passes the sort of 30 second or one minute kind of test and you know something looks kind of interesting to me then I keep digging a little further and a little further and a little further and depending on the business you know maybe it is something you can figure out really quickly um, if it's a more complicated business model oftentimes that can take maybe weeks or months to really genuinely understand properly so um, in terms of things I'm looking at to just d discard stuff immediately it would be like obscenely high valuations you know uh, a crazy like 10 20 30 plus multiple to sales or something like that is kind of an obvious one 
uh, maybe a business that's been declining and burning money for a long time, something like that. Uh, granted, I do have a company like Heritage Growth Properties in my portfolio, which kind of has those characteristics, but um, that's a bit of an interesting kind of special situation, I suppose. But um, yeah, I'm more looking to kind of quickly discard ideas than, uh, you know, quickly invest in new ideas. So I uh, appreciate your question, Andy. Next one is from After Dinner Investor. Any ten cent yet? Uh, no, I have not made an investment in ten cent. Uh, I did check out Monish Barai's talk though, where he went into quite a bit of depth on ten cent. Uh, I find the whole thing interesting, particularly the NASPERS and process lens of ten cent, where you can potentially buy into ten cent at a discount to, um, you know, just buying it straight up on one of the US exchanges. Um, but I really think I would need more time to get my head around the business model. I mean, Monish Barai gave us the explain it to a five-year-old kind of version where uh, Pony Ma gives uh, a bunch of money to software developers, but he can only kind of spend so much there, but he gets great returns on capital. And then the rest of it go to these, you know, uh, basically Chinese Warren Buffetts where they're investing in um, earlier stage, often software companies as well. So, um, I don't know. I, I really think I could get my head around the software side of that business if I, you know, really worked at that. Um, I'd be interested to see what the venture capital portfolio kind of looks like, but I think that's a more difficult one to understand what maybe the future returns might look like over time as well. But um, I'm not completely ruling it out, but I haven't made an investment in 10 cent uh, at this stage. Next question is from Frank Tabor. What are your thoughts on MJ stocks? An industry with virtually no institutional capital and a huge tailwind as it gets legalized and normalized. Any interest? Um, yeah, so I must say this one's well, well outside of the circle of competence for me. Um, but I have spoken to people with investments in this industry and there are some kind of interesting char characteristics to the business. Um, you know, they've got really um, strange kind of local monopolies almost because um, in particular states of the US, you know, it's not, uh, and I don't know a lot of the details on this, but my understanding at least is it's really difficult to set up like a national uh, MJ business where you can transport product all over the place. I think there's restrictions around moving product across borders and that sort of thing even within a country um, so you end up with a lot of these sort of localized monopolies which was really interesting now whether that changes over time i don't know as things do maybe become more normalized and get legalized it reminds me a little bit of a lot of warren buffett's early newspaper investments which were kind of local monopolies as well which were fantastic businesses until they were obviously disrupted by the internet and everything um but yeah i think it, there's some interesting characteristics um, currently and you know legalization may be a tailwind in some ways but potentially it's a headwind to these local monopolies in other ways so again a little bit like 10 cent it's not one i'm completely ruling out but uh, it would really have to be a no-brainer like i'm not gonna fly to the US and start sampling product or anything like that. Um, you know, I, I have no interest in that. So, um, you know, maybe I would I would make an investment in that industry at some point, but it's really um, not kind of squarely in my circle, I would say. So appreciate your question. Our next one's from David Harrison is volume versus intensity, the training equivalent of value versus growth. Uh, yes, if you're a gym rat, you may know what that means. Uh, next question is from Tom Maslin. Hi Tom, keep up the good work on margin of shave D Mobro, appreciate that. Um, have you looked into Intel Corporation as a value stock at all? Personally, I see it as undervalued and was wondering whether it has come past your radar at all. Maybe I'm missing something, thanks Tom. Um, yeah, another one of these interesting ones, I have actually taken a bit of a look at Intel and uh, it certainly looks a lot cheaper than uh, many of its competitors, I would say. Um, it's certainly slower growing though, so you know, just straight up comparing like a PE multiple or something, or even an enterprise value EBIT multiple, acquires multiple or something, across the various um, businesses in that sector, I don't think is a particularly fair comparison, just because Intel is growing a lot slower. Um, but the super investors in it, they're doing a lot of buybacks. Um, I can kind of see why people are invested in it, but again, it's kind of touching the edge of my circle of competence, and I think uh, I would have to do some more serious work to kind of understand that industry more fully. And, uh, you know, I think there's more attractive um, propositions out there for me at the moment. So um, I don't feel particularly compelled to make an investment in Intel. 
I think there's other opportunities where the downside risk is lower, upsides may be a bit better, and I understand those situations a lot better than something like Intel. But um, yeah, I, I can see why people are interested in it for sure. So thanks for your question. Uh, next one is from another Tom. If you could clone any of Norbert Lou's current holdings, uh, which one would it be and why? Um, yeah, so if anyone doesn't know, Norbert Lou runs uh, Punch Card Capital. He was also... Uh, He's probably also one of the most famous accounts to ever be on the Value Investors Club. Uh, I think his username was Charlie479, and there's a Joel Greenblatt lecture from like 2005 going through some of uh, going through some of Norbert Lou's write-ups from the Value Investors Club. So uh, Norbert Lou's definitely one of my favorite investors, although he does kind of fly under the radar a lot. Uh, I've never even seen like a photo of Norbert Lou. <laughs> I don't even know what he looks like. So um, he's definitely undercover, but he's got a phenomenal track record and runs a very concentrated portfolio. So just off the top of my head here, I think uh, in his portfolio, you will see Ally Financial, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Winnebago, I think are his only three US holdings. He's also got a couple of overseas ones that we can see on sites like Ticker. I think that includes uh, Naked Wines and also uh, like Motor Group PLC, I think is the other business. So um, in terms of the ones I'd be most interested in cloning, um, I guess Berkshire's an obvious one. Ally Financial is one that I would probably rule out just again, circle of competence uh, issue there. Um, I have an investment in Winnebago's main competitor actually, which is Thor Industries. So I understand that one pretty well. Um, and it trades at a similar valuation to Thor, although Winnebago has a slightly more diversified business in terms of the industries that they touch. Um, Thor is very much, uh, you know, RVs, motorhomes, trailers, whatever you want to call them, depending on whether you're uh, in the US or New Zealand. But um, Winnebago has sort of its core business in RVs and, and trailers. But they also have like, um, you know, a boat business and some other stuff as well. So um, if I had to pick, it would probably be either Berkshire or Winnebago. But I'm kind of struggling to, to pick between those two a little bit. Uh, Wine Library, I found a really interesting business model. And when Norbert Lou bought it, I can see that it was um, really cheap, I think. On an enterprise value basis, it might have been trading at like five times free cash flow or something. They seem to have a lot of cash kind of sitting around, but uh, the price has shot up a lot since then. And it's, um, you know, a business I've heard kind of mixed reviews on the actual product from from, from a few people as well. So, uh, yeah, if I had to choose, maybe Winnebago or Berkshire. Okay, next question is from All About Nature. Any renewable stocks you looked at before? Um... Not really. I don't have that kind of, I guess, top-down approach of I want a renewable sector stock or I want a, a, you know, electric vehicle stock or anything like that. It's very much just kind of uh, looking through business after business and seeing if I can understand it and then I kind of go from there. Um, but even that said, I really haven't got a lot of renewable energy stocks in my portfolio. I've got some businesses that kind of touch aspects of that, I suppose. Maybe the best example might be something like Graftec. Um, I've still got a very small position in Graftec. I've sold most of it. And once I'm fully out of that, I'll do kind of a, a bit of a post-mortem on that particular investment. But Graftec, for anyone that doesn't know, um, basically supplies graphite electrodes to uh, steel producers. So um, if a steel producer is using the electric arc furnace method as opposed to a blast furnace, uh, that's a much more kind of environmentally friendly way of producing steel you're using recycled steel many times and it's actually much less capital intensive from kind of a business model perspective as well so um, there has been a bit of a trend towards electric arc furnaces as opposed to blast furnaces and you know the world's going to need steel for a long time right that's not going anywhere so um, I don't know that you'd really call that a renewable energy stock or even close to that but that's probably the one I have that um, gets you know, maybe it's the most environmentally friendly. I don't, I don't quite know how to word that, but um, appreciate your question anyway. So, uh, next one is from James. What are your top three YouTube channels excluding Punch Card? Um, yeah, so all the Punch Card crew are great. I will say all the Margin of Shavedy team are great as well. Um, I won't name everyone, but I'll maybe put up a couple of screenshots here of the Margin of Shavedy team. Um, in terms of investment channels that I follow. Um, I don't watch a lot of the bigger channels. I watch a little bit of Graham Stephan, but um, I don't watch too many of the other kind of larger finance channels. Um, I really like what uh, you know everyone on the Margin of Safety team pretty much is, is up to. Um, I also like watching Sven Carlin. I think he does great content in terms of just uh, really uh, short, snappy kind of business analysis and intrinsic value analysis as well. So I'm sure you've heard of all of those people, but, but that's uh, a couple of my favorites. 
Okay, next question is from Jay Phillips. Thoughts on the travel industry stocks that are best positioned to take off with borders opening in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I don't know if take off was like a travel pun or something there, but uh, I like it, uh, even if it was unintentional. Uh, yeah, again, I, I really don't look at the world in this sort of top-down view of saying this particular, you know, macroeconomic event or something is happening and then, you know, let's try and try and find stocks associated with that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the stock market in general is a discounting machine. So what it's trying to do the entire time basically is figure out what the future cash flows of businesses are going to be and then they discount that back to today. So, you know, part of that process, if, you, if someone's analyzing a travel business is saying, you know, if this travel business happens to be particularly exposed to New Zealand and Australia, you know, when do we think things are going to open up? And they'll be building these, you know, projections into their forecasts. And of course, if things change to be much more rosy towards um, having more travel sooner and that sort of thing, that can certainly have an impact. But I think a lot of that, and this is sort of an efficient market type argument, and I'm not trying to say markets are fully efficient all the time, but uh, you know, most of the time the market gets these things mostly right. And what we're really looking for as value investors is these sort of edge case situations where the market really has got it wrong and we've got a clear edge that kind of allows us to see that. So um yeah I, I really can't give you any names on that and whether that'll actually happen i don't quite know i mean we had uh we had air new zealand for example in the early stages of the pandemic crash and then all of a sudden it kind of became like a meme stock here in new zealand and took off again even though you know air new zealand was having a terrible time in its underlying business so um it's just too hard to predict that stuff, especially in the short term. But I uh, appreciate your question nonetheless. Uh, next question is from Om Omur. Uh, Hi Tom, can you do some digging into universal dis universal displays? Um, I will add it to the watch list. I've never heard of that business, but uh, I will have a look into it. <laughs> it might be one of these ones that I quickly dismiss. It might not. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, next question is from Huber T. What is your financial goal? Uh, yeah, I have a few different financial goals. Um, I have a couple sort of shorter term ones. So I had a savings target goal kind of for the calendar year of 2021. Uh, also had a goal to purchase uh, you know, our first home in 2021 as well. Um, the first home is a little tricky, kind of been in lockdowns and things at the moment in New Zealand, but we'll get there on that one eventually. And uh, yeah, in terms of longer term financial goals, it's really just to reach financial freedom, essentially. You know, I have really no aspirations to be um, filthy rich and drive a bunch of Ferraris or anything like that. Um, it's really about just having freedom to do what, I'm, do what I want with my time, essentially. So, um, you know, the number that allows you to get to that point will be different depending on where you live and what lifestyle you want to live and all that sort of thing. Um, but that's the way I sort of think about it. Okay, next question here is from uh, Sten. I think this is the second question from Sten, actually. Uh, would you buy Berkshire for your 401k or uh, worldwide ETF or SP500? Uh, yeah, I can't recommend an individual stocks, uh, and we don't have 401ks here in New Zealand, uh, but we do have a KiwiSaver, uh, which is kind of a our superannuation or retirement kind of account. Uh, so, uh, KiwiSavers, for the most part here in New Zealand, are really pretty inflexible in terms of what you can actually do with them. You can pick, um, you know, growthier funds, which tend to have more exposure to, to shares. Uh, you can pick more conservative funds, which tend to have more allocation to cash and bonds, and you can pick a mix of kind of things in between. But you really can't go into those accounts and pick individual stocks or anything, at least that I know of. So um, personally, I have all my retirement accounts just indexed um, with kind of a high growth type fund here in New Zealand that has a lot of exposure to shares. But again, any, everyone's personal situation is going to be different. Um, I should actually say that I'm not currently in that growth fund. I may have misspoke just then. I'm more in a conservative fund right now because I'm actually planning to use that money for uh, a first home purchase. But once we're over that hurdle, it'll be getting switched back towards the, the growthier fund. But um, if you're asking me just to speculate a little on, on what might perform best, um, it's really hard to kind of figure this stuff out but I kind of like Berkshire just purely because I understand that better and I think I can get a good feel for what the future returns are likely to be out of something like Berkshire Hathaway which I would find much much more challenging in an S&P 500. 
But again, please don't take that as financial advice. Do your own work and, and make your own decisions on that one. So I uh, appreciate your question nonetheless. Uh, next one is from Henry. Uh, just wondering what your thoughts are on A2 Milk. Some financial reporters are starting to talk about it again. I think it's too early to call. Also, uh, what are the Kiwis' chances in the World T20 comp cheers? Uh, well, let's get the easy question out of the way first, which is around the World T20 uh, competition. I think that's a no-brainer that the Black Caps are going to win that one, but uh, time will tell, <laughs> and we'll see how that goes. Um, in terms of A2 Milk, if you want to check out my full thoughts on that, um, shameless plug to my second YouTube channel, which is uh, The Investing With Tom Podcast. I actually did a recent podcast episode with Neil from the Adventurous Investor YouTube channel, so um, head over and check that out. We spent probably 10 or 15 minutes talking through all our thoughts with A2 Milk, so um, you'll get a far better answer from that podcast episode than from me giving you a 30 second answer in a QA and a here, so um, definitely go and check that one out. Our next question is from Super Red uh, XIII13, a <laughs> great username. Uh, how do you use, presumably that means free cash flow yield to find an undervalued company? Um, yeah, so free cash flow yield, if you don't know, it's similar to a earnings yield, I suppose. So, um, you know, a company earns a dollar a year in free cash flow, the price is 10, that's a 10% earnings yield. Um, I use that as a nice kind of starting point oftentimes. That's one of these like mental valuation tools that I can just, um, you know, pull out of the tool belt without needing to fire up spreadsheets or anything like that. So I actually do use that a little bit from time to time. And I know a lot of value investors focus on that, you know, rather than running a discounted cash flow, they'll say, you know, if I invest in this business today at current prices with the current cash flows, I think I'm going to get maybe a 5% free cash flow yield and the business is growing and maybe, you know, next percent it'll be a, next year I should say it'll be a 6% free cash flow yield and then maybe a 6.5% and so on. And, you know, I think I'll do well as a result, particularly if you compare that against interest rates that I can get in a bank of like less than 1%. So I think that's a useful framework, um, particularly when you're doing sort of quick and dirty valuations and you're just trying to think through that stuff in your head. Okay, next question is from uh, Kalichi. Uh, worst part of shaving for me, it's the itchiness. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've always been a Schick man, uh, Schick branded razors and everything. Uh, I kind of, it's just one of those things that like I have been since I was a teenager and have just kept using those products. And last November, I don't know if like I thought the hairs on my face had become like thicker or <laughs> what had quite happened but last november i was like shaving with even like a day of growth and it was like so much tugging it was real painful and i was getting a bunch of shave rash and all sorts of stuff so um i went out and i spent a bunch of money on switching over to gillette just to give that a go because it was quite a poor experience last year uh, and it's actually a lot better that's made a surprising difference so um i actually don't mind shaving right now um the beard will come back at some point but <laughs> that's kind of where i'm at with that uh Kalichi, if you don't know has his own youtube channel as well so definitely go check that out uh, and he is part of the margin of safety team so um, that's probably why he's asking that question so thanks for your question there Kalichi uh, next one is Sunil do you plan to go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole um, don't have any immediate plans uh, on that one but uh, you never know uh, next one is from Jonathan how do you know whether to pass on a company because it's outside your circle of competence or choose to study the business and expand your circle of competence so I'll take the first part of that question first. If you're asking if a business is in your circle of competence, the Charlie Munger answer to that question would be, uh, you know, to ask the question is to answer it. So if you're asking, is this business in my circle of competence? It's probably not. Um, and in terms of uh, studying the business to expand your circle of competence, I think that's something that'll just happen naturally as you, um, you know, spend more time investing, as you'll understand more industries. There'll be a central company that you study, but maybe they've got suppliers and customers and so on where you start to get a fringe understanding of their businesses and the world just starts to kind of, all the dots start to connect and that sort of thing. Um, but if there's a business that looks really interesting from a valuation perspective, I think it can be a really good idea to just do a deep dive on it and see if you can figure it out. And then once you get to the end of that process, again, if you're still questioning whether this is really in your circle of competence, it's probably not, um, you know, but knowledge is cumulative and it never hurts to kind of go through that process. 
Okay, so that is all the questions we have time for on this video. Um, there were a few I couldn't quite get to, so I apologize if that happened to be your question. Um, be sure to follow along with the community posts for uh, you know the following month and so on, so that you can get a, another question in there quickly for next month's Q&A video. But uh, thank you to everyone who uh, did, uh, did ask a question for this one, and thank you uh, if you've watched to this point in the video. If you did enjoy it, please hit like, and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. But that's it for me for this one, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.